Connors T, how are you? Welcome to the Candle of Tales podcast. I'm Sarah Hegarty and I'm here with my brother. And I'm Aaron. We are the co-founders of Candlelit Tales and we tell stories with music and we're going to have a bit of a chat after them. Well, we usually have a little bit of a chat after the stories, but this week we're doing something a little bit different. Oh, yeah. Because this week we're going to tell you three short stories about some of the heroes of the Fianna. That's right, yeah. And then next week we're going to tell you three short stories about entirely different heroes of the Fianna. And so next week... We're going to talk about all of them at once. Cool. So let us know what you think. Would you prefer to hear just the stories? Or are you missing the chat? Do you miss the chat? Is it yeah. ruining your cup of tea? Like you're going to have to, you're going to have to make some tough decisions after yeah. this, folks. Let us know. Do you miss the chat? I always miss the chat. I know. But this, this is a bit of an experiment. So we're going to have a few stories, three in a row, and see how that goes. All right. So let's get cracking. Aaron, tell us the story. All right. There was once a king in Ireland, and he wanted to find out who the fastest man was. And so, he sent messages to invite all the runners from all over the land to Tara. Once gathered, they lined up and listened to the challenge the king proposed. He wanted to know how long it would take each one of them to run around Ireland and gather one grain of sand from every beach on the land. The men looked at one another, at first perplexed by this incredible challenge, but then the boasting began. A man from the south declared, There might be a lot of beaches, but you know what? I'm so fast, I'll race right on past all ye. We'll gather a grain of sand from all over this land and we'll back in about a... Jeez, there's so many... Give me a month, like, that's fair enough, isn't it? No, the man standing next to him leaned towards him and said, Here, don't mind this, I'm a dawn, no. If you come down to the kingdom near, there's only one beach you want to be looking at, and that's the one that goes as long as a mile, but we call it an inch. And after that, I'll go running around the place, and I'll guarantee you, even though I have to leave my own home, I'll get a grain of sand from every beach faster than that buck over there now, and it'll only take me three and a half weeks. The boasting continued, every one of the men declaring shorter and shorter times. Even the man from the west said, Oh, don't you know, we'll be hipping and hopping and jumping and skipping around to the beach, the beach. And sure, I'll get the best beaches out in the west, and then I suppose I'll have to go down south, all right, but I'll get around it in about two weeks. Give me about two weeks there now, I'll sort it out for you, not a bother. I'll be out in the home of the west lands of Mayo, with the green and the red flags flying high. Not a bother of me, don't you know? Yahoo! Even the men from the Midlands shouted out, even though I didn't know what a beach looked like till I was about 14 year old, and I was in the flat land of Ireland by the back of Allen there now. Well, I'll still run faster than the wind, so I'll get down there in about two weeks, back here with the grain of sand from every land. Don't mind these. Two weeks may hold. I'll do it, right and surely. I'll do it so bloody well fast, I'll be right on past all the rest of ye. Fools, two days. Give me two days, we'll sort it out. Do you know what I mean? The king was realising that this was a very bad thing to do in the end he was going to have them all kill each other by the end of it until they all turned round and looked a tall grey thin man was walking towards them carrying a heavy bag over his shoulder he was panting and sweating and by the time he reached the king he landed the bag at his feet and he said While you were all talking, and that man's name was Quilta Macrono, the fastest man of the Fianna, and the fastest by far of all the men and women in Ireland. Conan Muel was the brother of Gol Morna, Fionn's great rival of the Fianna. But he was 
fondly nicknamed Conan Whale for his bald head. He was also nicknamed Mulk Thorn, which meant insulter, because he never had a good word when two ill words could suffice. But he was well respected nonetheless. At one stage, Fionn suggested he might take the blackthorn as his totem plant because it encompassed his stubborn and prickly nature, but it occasionally blossomed with masses of pure white flowers that brightened the entire plant. Something similar to Conan, he thought. On one day, Conan went out with some of the other heroes of the Fianna, and it was getting dark, and they sought shelter in a cave nearby a running stream. When they went into the cave, they all fell asleep fairly quickly, but when they woke, they realised they were under an enchantment, and they were all stuck fast to the rocks they had slept on. They let a great shout out, and the cave reverberated this shout and echoed around the lands, and quilled them a groan on the fastest man in Ireland, a tall, grey, thin man first and ran to help his friends. When he arrived there, he saw they were in trouble, but he knew just what to do. There was a stream of water dripping down at the back of the cave, and Quilta saw that this was magical water, and he thought he knew what to do. So he filled a jug with this slow, dripping water, and when it was filled, he went around to each one of the men that had been stuck fast where they were, and he poured water over them, and Fionn got up then from where he had been dislodged, and dear Divna stood up too. But when Quilta McGrown on got to Gull McMorna, he had run out of water. He managed to splash some to relieve his hands and legs, but his back was stuck fast to the rock he was lying on, as was his head. You'd have pulled me up out of this, Fionn, don't leave me lying here like a turtle on me back. And so, hearing that, Fionn and Dermot grabbed a hold of Conan Moyle, and they pulled with such might that they ripped him right off of the rock, tearing the skin off his back. Now he left out such a yell. It startled everyone and the animals nearby, but Fionn and Dermot ran out and they saw a black, and they saw a black sheep. They caught it quickly and killed it, sheared it and shaved the skin off its back. And they placed the skin of the black sheep fast down on top of Conan Whale, just to let it grow in, they thought. They poured some of the drips of the magic water onto it, and it stuck fast onto him. And from every year on, Conan Whale had to be sheared, for he grew a great bushy back of black hair. And out of this hair, they wove great trousers and a great black tunic for him as well, which he wore with pride, but if anyone laughed about his hairy back, they would get a smack to the back of the head, for Conan Whale did not take kindly to laughter that was directed at his expense. The Birth of Bran and Skiolon In the time of the Fianna, there was a great chieftain of Ulster, a man named Olin Eachtuk. And he had a lover of fairy, a woman named Octodalb of the Fair Breast. The two of them were not married. Though they were very close, they had an arrangement that suited them both. You see, any time that Olin Eachtuk wanted to meet with his lover, he'd go to the woods by her she, and he'd give a particular whistle, and before too long, Octalb would appear. She would take him into fairy for the night, they would wander beneath those alien stars, he would take her in his arms and he would call her his star of wisdom, his beauty, his blossom, his true love, and they would make love in the other world. And then he would go home, and she would go back to what she'd been doing before he whistled for her. And they were both very happy with this arrangement. 
One person who was not entirely convinced of this arrangement was Okdalb's sister, who started to ask her some rather pointed questions about her mortal lover, and how exactly did Okdalb know that he wasn't chasing other women back in the mortal world? To which Okdalb would always reply, why on earth would he chase any woman when he has me? Have you seen me? I'm amazing. But there came a time when Olin Erdok failed to call on Okdalb, and she started to worry about him. And her sister's questions got a little bit more pointed. Was he sick, maybe? Was he terribly busy these days? Or, or had he maybe met somebody else? Okdalb, in a rage, insisted that Olin would not desert her unless he was on his deathbed, and she went into the mortal world to find him. When she found out that he'd gotten married, her Rage knew no bounds. Some time before this, Olin Eachtok had gone on a visit to the great Fionn McCool in his house at Almuin, and when he arrived there, he found a household in a pleasant sort of disarray because Fionn was entertaining some very important visitors. Two of them, in particular, beautiful, elegant women. One. The elder was Myrna, Fionn McCool's own mother, a dear woman who was swift and graceful and lovely as a deer herself. And the other was her sister, Turin, younger than she. And while Myrna was a beautiful woman, Turin was something else entirely. And Turin was causing a bit of a stir among the Fianna. She was incredibly lovely. Her face was kind and shone with this warmth that made everyone who was in her presence feel good about themselves. She had a way of talking to you that would make you feel like you were the most interesting person in the world it might take you a little while to realise that she talked to everybody in the same way. Turin just really liked people. She was as gentle and kind as she was lovely. Her body was as slender and supple as a reed. And when she moved, it was said that she moved like a river flowing and graceful, and everyone thought that Turin would flow to him. The upshot of this was that the house of Fionn McCool was like a hornet's nest after it has been kicked. It was a tense place with a low thrum of violence under everything at every day, because everyone there fell in love with Turin. All of the married members of the Fianna were sullen and downcast, knowing that they hadn't a chance with her, and all of the single members went about glaring at one another with bloodshot eyes, though when they turned those eyes on Turin they were soft and melting, and it was only a matter of time before a fight of some sort broke out, though the fact that she was their captain's aunt was putting manners on everybody for the moment. Now when Olin saw that everyone in the Fianna prized Turin so highly, he thought to himself that this was a contest that he could win. See, he was used to being around beautiful women. He'd been in and out of the Shi for years now, and he'd gotten so used to being around Uckdal, but she didn't really affect him more than any other beautiful woman did. And so he was quite able to talk to Turin without having his breath stolen away and without his wits turning to jelly on him. So he decided he would try to win this woman's heart. 
because this was a contest against the Fianna that he would have some hope of winning. He went on long walks with Turin. He called her his star of wisdom, his blossom, his true love, and Turin found herself wooed. Lugud of the Fianna, who had become Turin's particular friend, he gave her away at the wedding that was shortly held after that, although his heart was breaking in his chest as he did so, because he loved Turin so much that whenever he tried to tell her how he felt, the words stopped in his throat and it choked him. And now he led her to her husband and sank into sorrow. Before Olin Erdok took Turin back to his home in Ulster, Fionn McCool took him aside and had a word in his ear. It was the kind of word that many of us have had with someone who starts going out with a friend of ours or a family member. You know, if you hurt her, I'll kill you. Only this was Fionn McCool talking, so Olin Erdok knew that he would literally be killed if he ever did anything out of the way to Turin. Besides that, Fionn McCool put a condition on their marriage that he was to be able to send for Turin at any time to check on her. He was to be able to call on Olin Erkdok at any time to visit them because maybe he didn't quite trust this Ulster man to do right by his aunt. Now, they were back in their house in Ulster, settling in and quite content with themselves. They were back in Olin Erkdok's house in Ulster, settling in and getting comfortable with each other at around the time that Ockdalb found out what Olin Erkdok had done. Ockdalb put the appearance of Fionn's most trusted messenger on her, a woman named Dardov, and knocked on Olin's door, claiming that Fionn had sent for his aunt to check on her. Now, Olin did not hesitate, and Turin packed up a few things and left to visit her nephew. But they had not gone far when Ockdalb turned on Turin, struck her with a hazel rod, and transformed her into a little grey hound. She put a leash on Turin and dragged the shivering hound all the way to Goliath, berating her all the way for being a man-stealing whore, cursing her up and down with a vocabulary that only a lady of the good people has access to. And she brought her to the house of a man named Fergus Fionlia. Fergus Fionlia was the king of Galiev and he was famous for one particular quirk in his personality and that was the fact that he absolutely could not abide dogs. He hated dogs, he hated hounds, he would not have a hound inside the threshold of his house and every last one of his servants was under strict instruction that if they saw a hound inside his household they were to drive it out with kicks and stones and curses. So Fergus Fionlia was quite perplexed when Dar Dove, the messenger from Fionn McCool, turned up and told him Fionn McCool has sent you this hound and says you are to take care of her. This put him in a bind. You see, he couldn't insult the great Fionn McCool by refusing a gift he'd been sent. He couldn't mistreat this hound, although he really wanted to because he hated hounds. But he had to let the hound inside his hole And then he saw that the hound, Turin, was shivering and whimpering. Turin was thoroughly traumatised. The poor hound, Turin, could do nothing but sit there and shiver and whine. She had had the worst day of anybody in Ireland. She had had by far 
the worst day of her life, turned into a hound by a jealous ex-lover of her husband, dragged across Ireland on a leash, berated, shouted at, and now delivered to a man who claimed an absolute hatred of hounds. And Fergus Fionlia, when he saw the hound there shivering, well, it was distracting. It was difficult to concentrate on what he was doing. And so he called one of his servants and he asked her, how do you stop it from making that noise? Do I cut its legs off? Do you, do you think Fionn McCool would be angry if I cut its legs off? And the servant said, yeah, no, I, I think that maybe wouldn't count as taking care of a hound if you were to cut its legs off. But you can stop a hound from shivering. It's actually pretty easy. All you have to do is pick her up and give her a little squeeze, maybe a little kiss. She'll calm right down. With the greatest reluctance and his face twisted in disgust, Fergus Fionlia picked up the hound, Turin. He cradled her and he walked up and down the hall with her, still shivering in his arms. Every five paces, he dutifully gave her a squeeze and kept walking, hoping that she would stop soon so that he could put her down. And then, very shyly, the little hound licked him on his chin. And Fergus Fionlia looked down at her. Now, Turin had been a particularly beautiful woman with these big grey eyes, and she was a particularly beautiful hound with the same big grey eyes. And when Fergus Fionlia looked into the grey eyes of Turin and saw that the hound had stopped shivering, he became absolutely besotted with this dog. That was it for Fergus Fionlia. From that moment on, he did not want to be anywhere away from this dog. He cuddled her, he petted her, he grew to love that little soft spot on her forehead between her eyes. She followed him into every room. And to his great delight, anyone who went to pet her that wasn't him, she'd growl at, just to show that he was her favourite as well. He called all of his servants together and gave them a big speech about how none of them were ever to throw anything at this hound. This hound was the apple of his eye, and if any of them did that, he would visit such destruction on them that they would live to regret it. And he detailed the punishment that he would do to them. And he detailed what he would do to them, and given that it started with flaying and ended with dismemberment, Really, they wouldn't be living long to regret anything if they threw a stone at Fergus Fionlia's favourite hound. He took her out hunting and he found her more swift and more savage than any hound he'd ever heard of. And after a little while, Fergus Fionlia noticed that she was slowing down a little bit. She was getting a little bit round around the middle. So he decided to keep her in. Meanwhile, Fionn McCool, being up in Ulster, decided to go and pay a visit on his aunt and see how she was getting on with her new husband. And when he arrived at the house, Ullen realised what had happened. He was rightly terrified, and Fionn McCool was absolutely furious to find that this man had lost his aunt. Ullen begged for a day to find her and Fionn promised him that if he did not produce Turin, Fionn McCool would take his head. Ullen knew who was behind this disappearance, even if he didn't know what she'd done, and so he raced as fast as he could for Ochdal's she, and there he whistled. And whistled. 
and whistled till his lips were cracked and sore. And then Okdalb stood before him with one eyebrow raised. Well, said she, did you take my wife? He said. If I did, said she, what's it to you? If I don't bring my wife back, Fionn McCool, the Fionn McCool, is going to cut off my head. Well then it seems to me, said she, that you need my help. And if I save your head, it seems to me that your head should belong to me, along with everything beneath it. Don't you think that's fair? And Olin had no choice but to agree. So Oxdalb of the Fair Breast brought Fionn McCool to Fergus Fionnlia's house in Gallia to fetch his aunt. She turned Turin back into a woman, breaking the heart of poor Fergus, and then she took Olin Eachdok with her into the other world to live forever by her side. Turin came back to Almun to Fionn McCool's household, and there Lugud finally untied his tongue for long enough to tell her how he felt about her. She immediately demanded that he prove to her beyond any suspicion that he had absolutely no lovers anywhere in the mortal world or in the other world, and only after he had done that did she consent to marry him. Fergus Fionnlia took to his bed in grief for his lost hound, until a year later when Fionn McCool selected a little greyhound just for him, and that became the new apple of his eye. All in all, things ended fairly neatly, except for one thing. Well, two things, really. When Turin was changed into a hound, she had been pregnant. And as a hound, she had given birth to two whelps. These were special hounds, having the intelligence of humans and the loyal hearts of dogs and Fionn took them into his hunting pack and they became his best hounds Bran the brindled, Skewlon with the stripe down her back they were his companions through thick and through thin never leaving his side till the day that they died because after all they were family Those were the tales of some of the greatest heroes of the Fianna. Wonderful warriors and their adventures. We would normally at this point have a bit of a chat about the stories that we've just heard, but we're going to hold off. I know. Dangerous. Risky move. Risky stuff. Risky. But let us know what you think about that. Do you miss the chat? Would you rather we shut up more often? You know, let us know. And in the meantime... Uh, this podcast was produced and edited by Oshin Ryan, so cheers for that, Oshin. Thanks, for Oshin. Um, stories by myself and Aaron. Yeah. And the music was by Oshin Ryan as well. And if you want to support us and support us in doing this podcast and maybe even doing this podcast more often, you can find us on patreon.com forward slash candlelit tales. And if you want to find out more about our upcoming live shows, we have a lot of them going on. You can find all the details on candlelittales.ie. Or the Insta faces and the grams of... Or the Insta face, twit, gram stuff. The yeah. social media. Social We're Candlelit Tales on all of the things, yeah. basically. Uh, if you want to get in touch, you can email us your comments, your questions and your feedback. That's info at candlelittales.ie. And if you want to book us for, you know... Private show, party, wedding, whatever. We do those too. We do all kinds of stuff. Or you can just DM us. Because that means direct message. You can DM us and you can Honest email us. Yeah, Facebook. you can you can slide into our DMs. Oh, that's, so weird. that's what the kids say. Is it? Apparently. Oh, no, wait. Maybe it means a different thing. <laughs> Let's not go down that just road. Just email us. Just email us on bookings at candlelittales.ie. 
Anyway, this was supposed to be a non-chatted version at the end of the story, so we uh, you you kept interrupting me. Right, lies. Right, next week we have more stories for you. Thanks more stories of the Fianna. We'll see you again soon. You.